Today, we're going to tackle this particular abstract animation. It contains a few techniques that might help you out in creating various other animations. So without any further ado, let's start right off. In our default scene, we're going to take our cube, hit X and delete it. Then we're going to shift A and add in a UV sphere. Once we've added in the UV sphere, we're going to hit 7 on our numpad to go to the top view and then just press tab to go into edit mode or alternatively switch to edit mode from the drop down over here. Then we can go ahead and switch to edge select mode and just make sure you press shift alt and then select and you'll see the entire line get selected. So like this, just select every single line that comes. Once you're done selecting every single line, press shift D X and just move it aside and then hit P and separate by selection. And then you can hit one to go into the front view and then just do the same thing with all of the horizontal lines. Remember, if you accidentally press something, just control Z will deselect whatever the last selection you made was. So that way you can go ahead and just select everything. And then similarly, shift D X, move it to the side P selection. And now you can tap to go into object mode and you'll notice that these two objects are their own objects, but the origin is still at the center. So if you move it, you'll see the origin doesn't line up with the geometry. So let's just select both of them, hit object, set origin, origin to geometry, and now they have their origins at the center. This particular sphere, we can go ahead and press control two to give it a subdivision surface of level two, or we can go to the modifiers tab and add in a modifier of subdivision surface and then change the level to two. After we add in the modifier, we can go ahead and click shade smooth from the drop down over there so that we have three objects. Now, if we actually go into the rendered view and switch off overlays, you'll see that we can't see the lines, but we want to see them. So in order to change that, we're gonna go ahead and increase our timeline over here and switch the timeline to the geometry node editor. Make sure you select any one of these two wireframes that we have at the moment, click new, and you'll see the new geometry node tree appear. Now we're gonna make these solid by converting the mesh to a curve. So let's search for mesh to curve and placing that right here and then searching for a curve to mesh. So let's search for a curve to mesh and placing it down here. And for the profile curve, we can pass in a curve circle and just plug the curve into the profile curve. Now the radius is way too large, so we can change the radius to something like 0.01. And now if you actually zoom in, you'll notice that the edges are fairly jagged. So to change that, we're just gonna add in a subdivision surface just after the group input, and we're gonna change the level to two. Also, since this is geometry nodes, we'll have to assign the material from here itself. So let's search for a set material node and place that just before the group output and choose the default material. Then we can go to the materials tab over here and just select the default material and change the name to something like metal rings. And you'll see that it updates over here as well. Once you're done with that, we want this wireframe to also get the same geometry node tree instead of creating it again we can just shift select the one that already has the modifier and then hit control l and select copy modifiers so that way it gets the geometry node tree as well so now once you have these three things we can select the two spheres hit m and select new collection and call this as rings and now we can go ahead and just hide the collection momentarily while we set up the rest of the scene we won't need the geometry node editor anymore so we're going to change that back to the timeline and just bring it down a bit so let's go ahead and set all of our animation defaults so let's go to the render properties switch on ambient occlusion bloom and screen space reflections go to the output properties and change the frame rate to 30 frames per second we can change the end frame to 300 so that we get a 10 second long animation the output folder we select to wherever we want it to be saved double slash saves it in the folder that the blend file is saved in change the file format to ffmpeg video and the encoding to mpeg4 with an output quality of perceptibly lossless apart from this in our render properties the color management we will play around with this later on but that's once we've actually added in the colors so that we get the right looks so now we can change the viewport shading to rendered so that we see what it actually looks like and then also place our camera so let's just go ahead select our camera all Alt G, Alt R to clear location and rotation, R, X, 90, and just G, Y to move it back a bit. Now hit zero in our numpad to go into the camera view. Alternatively, you can go to view, viewpoint, camera. Now we obviously don't want our background to be gray, so we're just gonna add in a plane at the background as well. So shift A, mesh plane, rotate it on the x-axis by 90 degrees, and then just scale it up till it's outside our camera's view, and then grab it on the y-axis and just move it back fairly far behind the sphere. So you can see how far it is, maybe a little bit further back. And there you go. After that, let's select our camera, go to the camera properties here and just change the viewport display passport out all the way to one so that we see only what's within the camera's view. Now let's go ahead and select our sphere, go to the materials and add in a new material. We'll call this as inner spheres and go ahead and decrease the roughness to a very small value, something like 0.1, increase the specular all the way to one and change the base color to a nice bluish color. 
So what we'll do is we'll change the hue to 0 0.5 so that it's perfectly on top and decrease the saturation to something like 0 0.4. Apart from that, we'll also make sure that the value is 1. We'll also go ahead and take our background plane and give it a new material. We'll call that as background and we'll change the base color to a pinkish color. So what we'll do is we'll keep the hue at 0 and change the saturation to 0 0.4. Again, value all the way to 1. And with that, we can just increase the roughness for the back plate and now play around with the lighting. So let's take our light and just move it in front of the sphere. So GY, move it in front and then G down so that it comes closer to the light. Now, if you actually look through the camera view, you'll see that the light is creating a shadow on the back plate that we don't want. So we're just going to go ahead and switch off shadows. And the actual point is seen very sharp. We don't want it to be that sharp. So what we're going to do is we're going to increase the radius of the light. And that gives this really nice soft shadow as well and nice large reflection over there. Along with that, we can just go to our world properties and change the background color to something even lower so that all of the lighting actually comes from our lights in the scene. So now that we have one light, let's just shift D and then place it down towards the bottom left of our camera view and shift D X and move this to the bottom right so that we have three lights set up. Now these two lights are way too powerful and they're not the right type that I want. So I'm going to go to the light properties, change it to an area lamp and also decrease the power to something like 200. Go out of the camera view and you see it's pointed in the opposite direction. So just point it towards our sphere by selecting that little yellow dot and pointing it at the sphere. So we'll do the same thing with the other one. We'll change the power to 200. We'll change it to an area lamp. We'll select the yellow dot and just move it to the sphere. Now, if we go into the camera view, we should see what it looks like. And you see, you get two lines because it's a rectangle and the size on the Y is really small. So we'll just increase the size on the Y as well. Go to light one and do the same. And now we have a nice three point light setup, but we'll reduce the power even more. So let's make this 50 and make this one maybe 100. So now that we have our lighting set up, we can go ahead and duplicate our spheres. But to know exactly where we duplicate it, we want to follow some sort of grid. So let's select our camera, go to the viewport display, composition guides and just take the golden triangle A and now you can see the composition guides but it gets mixed up with the light rays coming out so what we can do is go to our overlays and just switch off extras so that we don't see the lights and we see only the composition guides so let's take our sphere and just shift D move it to the side scale it down take this itself and just move it down a bit so that's not perfectly in the center shift D move that there and just play around till you add in whatever number you think suffices for your animation and play around with the scale of the different spheres and things like that. Once you're done placing all of them, you can go out of the camera view and you'll see that all of them are within the same Y plane. We don't want that, so we're just going to move them along the Y axis so that they move out of each other's way when the actual up and down motion is added in. So just grab them and move them around. Make sure that when you move them front, you don't move them in front of where your lights already are because that way they'll create unwanted shadows. And let's go back to our camera view. And now we have all of the objects and you see this one is a bit too front. So let's just move it back this one as well. So now we actually want all of these to animate. But before we add in the animation, let's go ahead and give them each their own rings. So let's select our rings again, select the first ring and just place it to our object. So let's to make it place perfectly, we'll select our object, shift S cursor to select it, then select our ring, shift S, selection to cursor and then we can just scale it up a little bit and maybe we can actually shift D and then just scale it up slightly more and then rotate it twice, maybe something like that. And that looks good. Now we can select both of these, select the sphere at the end and press control P set parent to object. And now we can add rings like this to all of our spheres and make sure that after you add the rings, you set parent to object. So let's select this sphere, shift S cursor to select it. Take this sphere, shift S selection to cursor, just scale it down a little bit, rotate it maybe a little bit. And there you go. Now select another sphere. Let's say this one will also get these vertical lines. So shift S cursor to select it. Take this shift D enter, then shift S selection to cursor and just play with the scale to match the sphere and of course rotate it around. So double tapping R creates a trackball that allows you to turn it in other ways. So now maybe this one will get rings. So shift S cursor to select it. Select one of these shift D enter shift S selection to cursor scale it down and rotate. And remember 
do not forget to parent them because if you do later on it will cause a lot of problems to fix it it'll just be a hassle later on so it's best that you parent them as and then you copy them so once you're done with that we also want a few build modifiers to be added to these so let's just select one of it go to the modifiers tab and you could have added the modifier right at the start so when you copied them you don't have to manually add it every time but we'll link them later on so that's not an issue so build and when you add in a build modifier you'll notice that as it goes it gets built but it starts you have to just initiate a start frame and the length so i don't want anything to happen for the first 30 seconds so we'll keep the start frame as 30 and we'll keep the length as 100 itself for all of them once you're done with the, that make sure that you select all of the other rings and finally select the final ring the one that already has the build modifier hit ctrl l copy modifiers alternatively you can just select everything in the rings collection over here and make sure that nothing else is selected so if anything else is selected just ctrl click till it's deselected so once you have everything make sure that the last thing that's selected was the last sphere so make sure that the sphere that has the build modifier is selected last and then just ctrl l copy modifiers so as soon as you do that you'll see all of them actually build in but i don't want all of them to build in at the exact same time i want them to all have a little bit of lag so let's say this outer sphere has to start nearby the ending of when the inner sphere is done so let's change this start frame to 100 then maybe we can change this one's start frame to 70 we can change this one's start frame to 45 and just like that change every single one of their start frames to different values or just so that they all start at different times so once we're done with that we can go ahead and just set the material for these rings as well so let's just go to our metal rings change the base color to the bottom so let's just give it a saturation of 0.5 and go ahead and increase the metallic all the way to one and just reduce the roughness quite a bit so maybe 0.2 and that should give you these nice rose gold rings and the screen space reflections should add really nice reflections and that should be fairly good now while we do the animations these rings are going to slow things down a lot so what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and switch off the rings animation the collection for now so that we can actually go ahead with the animation let's go back to frame zero select one of these and now change the timeline to the graph editor go to the object properties over here and just on the location of z add in a keyframe so this is going to be the middle point at around frame 20 we'll have it go up on the z-axis by 0.5 units and then we'll just add in a keyframe and then at frame 60 we'll have it go down on the z-axis so gz minus one and then just add the keyframe over here and then at 80 we want to come back to the original position so we'll just take this shift d x and just move it all the way to 80. so once we're there you'll see that we get the animation that it just goes up and down but it also seems to like stop right after so we Go ahead and tap N and make sure that the Z location is selected. Go to modifiers, add in a cycles modifier. So the moment you do this, you'll see it go up and down fairly nicely like it's floating. So instead of doing this to every single one of the objects, we're going to go ahead and just select all of the objects except for the one that has the animation data. And then first hit control A to apply location and then shift select the one that has the animation data. Then press control L and link animation data. So now all of them are going to go up and down in the exact same way but obviously we don't want all of them to go up and down in the exact same way we want them to all go in their own methods so what you can do is with all of them still selected go to object relations and make single user and just choose the object animation so the moment you do this you can change each one's animation individually without affecting the others so you go down to the f curves use hit a and change these out to change the phase of whether it's up and down you can just grab it on the x-axis so press gx and if you move this you can see the phase changes as in the position where it's starting apart from that if you actually g y and grab it on the y-axis you actually move the overall position of the y-axis or the z-axis in 3d space so how high it is and if you scale it on the x-axis you make it go up and down faster or slower based on how you scale it and if you scale it on the y-axis you essentially change the scale or the amount which it moves so by doing this four movements on the x and y axes and scaling it on the x and y axis you can give each of them something unique so you can just grab it on the x scale it on the x and scale it down on the y a little bit take this one this one if you actually watch the animation when it goes to the bottom most position it goes off screen and i don't want that so that's why i can just take all of this press a g y and just move it up so that the bottom most position is just above the screen and then 
go ahead and scale on the x g x just move it around and things like that once you've made all of them random you'll see the random animation move along to just make sure you're seeing it at the actual pace you can change back from the graph editor to the timeline and just change the playback from play every frame to frame dropping and you'll see what it looks like in real time so if it looks random enough to you you can go ahead but if it doesn't seem random enough you can go ahead and change and play around with it in the way graph editor so i think this looks fine so what i'll do now is switch on our rings once again and switch off overlays so that we see what it actually looks like and you'll see that it becomes really slow because we also have our build modifiers and everything working in the background and it's quite a lot of geometry what we can do now is just add in a few more lines for aesthetic purposes so let's shift s cursor to world origin then shift a mesh cylinder and s 0 0.01 scale it on the z-axis by something really large maybe 1000 and then just rotate it till it matches matches up with our composition guide. Once we have that, go to the materials, add in a new material, go all the way down to emission and just make it emissive of the same colors. So we'll make this a nice blue. So we'll keep the saturation at 0 0.5 and increase the emission strength to maybe 100. And then we'll just shift D, Z, move it down by maybe minus 0 0.15, shift D, Z, move it up by 0 0.3. So that's essentially 0.15 up. And then maybe you can shift D, Z again by maybe 0 0.5 units and shift D, Z minus one unit. No. Then select the bottommost one, shift D, Z minus 0 0.5 units so that we have five units up, five units down. Now all of them blue doesn't look too good. So what we'll do is we'll select one of these. So you can actually see that I select selected one of them. If I switch on, switch on overlays, go all the way to the material and just press this duplicate button. And now change the emission color hue from 0.5 to zero so that it becomes that pinkish hue. And then just select this one, the one over here. So the alternate one and just give it the same new material, which was material 001. So now we have a fairly decent composition. We just have to make sure that during the entire animation, nothing actually clips over each other and things like that if we did move all of them on the y-axis correctly that shouldn't be an issue passing through the light is not too much of an issue it causes really good reflections and i think that's fine some of them can be behind the light some of them can be in front so the last thing that we have to do before actually rendering this out is going down to the color management in the render properties and changing the look from none to something like very high contrast and immediately you'll see a difference personally i think very high contrast works the best for this i've tried high contrast as well but it's also a little bit of personal preference and what you think suits your scene the best i think this suited the best i also tested by reducing the gamma some people might love the look of this so i think a gamma value of 0 0.3 also looks really cool but all of these are as always artistic preferences and you can keep changing them and tweaking them till you get something that perfectly suits your taste but for now i'm going to keep the gamma at one and render it out as well as at 0.3 and render it out so i got two versions of it and the last thing that's left to do is just render the animation. Hopefully you learned something useful from this particular tutorial. The use of the F curves, maybe the modifiers and how you can copy modifier data or maybe convert just edges into solid objects using geometry nodes. Whatever it is, I hope you use these techniques in various other animations and I will keep posting more. So until then, don't forget to stay creative.